Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Lovely to see everyone here uh, this morning. My name is Rob Parson. I'm the pastor here at Woola Evangelical Church. So lovely to have everyone here, particularly if you're visiting, if this is first time. Um, so just to explain, during the service, there'll be songs and prayers and, and hymns and so on. And then about halfway through, some readings and the sermon. And that'll be when the children tend to head out and up to a Sunday school upstairs. So just to give some heads up as to what's happening there. Um, Notice-wise, um, things to mention include the Bible Ministry Weekends coming up. So there are some of these flyers just at the back that you can get hold of, just detailing the March, May, September and November Ministry Weekends. First one, March 4th and 5th, coming up quickly, and that'll be with Al Sims from People International. So that'll be happening in here on that Saturday. Any more information, do just ask or grab one of these flyers. That's just to mention those Bible ministry weekends. Um, and then a couple of things I mentioned in the weekly email, but Wednesday evening will be a prayer meeting here and Steve will be uh, leading us in that prayer meeting. And then Thursday evening, you may or may not have noticed on the email, I just flagged up a resource which has been put on by Oak Hill Theological College, which is where I train down in London. There's a professor called Eric Ortland, uh, an Old Testament professor. He'll be doing some teaching on mostly the book of Job, but also about approaching suffering and trials in life and kind of bringing those two things together and what we can learn. He'll be doing that. It will be an online thing uh, on Thursday night. And if you're interested in watching that, Rob and I will be watching that together in the evening. Um, if there's enough interest, then we could always do it up, up here and watch it on these screens. If not, people are very welcome to our house, to our living room. So if that's something that sounds at all interesting, do be in touch. Um, there's more information on the weekly email. So just to flag that up, because that's coming up this Thursday. There we go. That's it for notices. Uh, let me read us uh, some uh, words from the psalmist as he's thinking about uh, the Lord and where his help comes from. So in Psalm 124, verse 8, the psalmist says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let me lead us in a prayer as we start our time together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a chance to gather together this morning. Thank you for the many mercies that you have shown us. And we do pray that as we come together now and we remember who you are, how perfect and holy and majestic you are, we do pray that you'd cleanse us from our sins and restore us in your image to the praise and glory of your name and that you'd do that through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We do know that there is... Salvation found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so, Father, we, we bless you this morning. We thank you that you hear the voice of our prayer and our hearts dance for joy, knowing that there is forgiveness. And this morning, in our songs and in our prayers and as we listen, we do want to bring you much praise. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to start uh, singing together, and our first uh, song this morning is See What a Morning, thinking about Jesus' resurrection. So let's stand and sing together.
Great. Well, young at heart people, if you wanted to come down to the uh, front for the uh, all age slot, um, then we will think a bit more about one of the questions from the New City Catechism that we've been working through. So, if I could ask Jen for PowerPoint, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so, last week, boys, Tommy wasn't here, was she? So, we've got to try and tell her what we learnt last week. We learnt something about what sin is. Can any of you remember what sin stands for? Shove off. Shove off. Yeah. It is I'm in charge. I'm in charge. And no to your rules. And no to your rules. Well done. So we were thinking about what does sin mean? Take S, I, and N. It means saying, shove off to God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. So when the Bible says we have sinned, that's what it's saying. It's saying that we have told God to shove off and that I'm in charge and that we've said no to God's rules. Well, today we have another question that helps us understand what we have done wrong, which means we need to be forgiven and rescued and saved and redeemed. So the next question is, what is idolatry? Does anyone, do you know what idolatry is, Reggie? A little baby in his tummy. That's a little person where their heart is, okay? It's not quite a baby in the tummy, but... You spotted it, so well done. But have you got any other ideas what idolatry might be? I can tell you. Idolatry is about worshipping something or someone that isn't God. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us a little bit more about what this means. So, if we go to this slide, we can read a little bit more from the book of Romans, where we're told what idolatry is and what it looks like. So, just to help everyone know what it says, and for the boys to be able to hear what it says, maybe if we could read it all out together, that'd be helpful. So, if we read, for although they knew God, they did not honour him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 25. Excellent. So, some of what it's saying there is that people have turned to worship things that are created, that are made on the earth, instead of worshipping the creator who made them all. So, in the ancient world, it might have been the case that they had some idols like these. These might have been some of the things that they worshipped. Can you see there, some things may be made of wood, or stone, or bronze, or silver, or gold, or sometimes a sun or the moon or even the earth. People might have worshipped some of these different sorts of things as if they were God. So that might have been like an older way of explaining idolatry or what people used to do. And they hoped that these things, say like you see these like wooden guys up here, they hoped that by talking to them or bowing down to them or offering them things, that they would help them, maybe help them keep them safe in battle or to save them or to rescue them. Now, do you think that these things that are here managed to do that? Do you think they, they helped them? No. No, no, I don't think they did, did they? Because at the end of the day, they are just created things, just pieces of wood or stone. Sorry. The moon can't help, no. So, if people start worshipping these sorts of things, then they're getting it all wrong. They're not worshipping the creator, they're worshipping the things that have been created. Or sometimes even worshipping creatures, maybe even other people, but not the creator. And that's what the Bible means about idolatry. It's the worshipping of something that we shouldn't be worshipping. And when we do that, that makes God angry with people that people have given the worship that he should get to something or to someone else. Okay, So God's not happy when people worship these things. And that's why the Bible says that there is a punishment to be faced 
for worshipping these sorts of things. Now, just as a bit of a, uh, a lovely plot spoiler in this New City Catechism, yes, we're learning about sin and we're learning about idolatry, and it's showing us that we need forgiveness and that there is a, a punishment for doing these sorts of things. But don't worry, it doesn't stop there. Because the whole next section of the New City Catechism takes us on to start thinking about the Redeemer, the one that comes to save us. So we'll move into that soon. But these are just trying to take us step by step to think about what's the problem. Because we've got to work out what the problem is before we start thinking about a solution or a saviour. So there we go. Well done for listening. Let me say uh, a short prayer and then you can head back to your seats. Creator God, we pray that you would forgive us for worshipping the things you have made. No personal thing should be our hope or our trust. You alone are self-existent and all-sufficient. May you be our all in all. Amen. Amen. Well done, everyone. And we're going to sing now. And the next song is one that speaks of that Redeemer that can deal with that problem. So our next song is There is a Redeemer. So let's stand and sing. going to turn to God in prayer now. So I'm going to uh, lead us. We'll pray for a few different things uh, for God and his characters, for us as eldership team here, and for the work of the Northeast Gospel Partnership. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, this morning that we have the privilege of being able to come before you to gather, to hear from you in your word, and to speak to you. We thank you so much that you have given us that privilege of access to your throne of grace, that we can talk to you and that you hear us and that you love to listen to us, that you love to answer prayer and that you care and that you will comfort us. And so we do thank you for who you are as a heavenly father that really cares for us, your children. And we do thank you that you are a timeless God, that you are beyond, above and outside of time, that you have existed since before time even began and will exist forever. We thank you so much that you can see everything all at one time. We thank you so much that you're not limited in any way, not bounded with the restrictions of time. And though that is so hard for us to get our heads around, the being outside of time, that is who you are. And so we do just praise you and thank you for that. 
We do pray that you'd help us to keep being humbled by your amazing nature and how much greater you are than us as your creatures and that you have existed from forever and would exist forever. So we do thank you and praise you for that this morning. But we also uh, ask for your help and we pray for the eldership team uh, here, for uh, myself and Steve and Mark. Thank you uh, so much for the uh, gifts and abilities and blessings you have uh, poured out along the way. And we do thank you that we have this opportunity and this privilege to be able to minister amongst your flock. But we do just pray for a real a wisdom, a discernment, an insight, a godliness, a faithfulness. And for all of those uh, requirements of eldership, Father, we do uh, pray on that you would help us to keep working at them and on them and to keep seeking to be godly and prayerful and kind to others. And so we do just pray that as we meet uh, fortnight by fortnight and discuss things and, and try to be uh, servants among the congregation here, we do just pray that you'd help us to serve joyfully and gladly and willingly and to be able to have insight into various uh, issues and ideas and directions for the future and to respond to the, the needs of the moment. And so we do just pray for your help, knowing that it's in your strength that we do anything. And so we do just pray for us as elders uh, here at Water Evangelical Church. And Father, as we just lift our eyes to uh, slightly further afield to the work of the North East Gospel Partnership, we do thank you for all of the different churches represented within that partnership, uh, from Newcastle uh, all the way uh, up, heading up uh, this way. And we do thank you for the way in which they have provided support uh, to various churches, to pastors within them. Uh, we do thank you for the way in which they've been able to run things like conference days and to resource things and to provide help and, uh, and advice and friendship. And so we do just pray for the work of North East Gospel Partnership, particularly we think of their training programme, where they're seeking, seeking to train up and to raise up workers for the harvest field, to be able to resource and equip people to know how to handle your word rightly, to be able to discern true and right doctrine, and to be able to teach that to others as well in many and various situations and scenarios. So we do thank you for the work of the North East Gospel Partnership, for Hugo Charteris as he heads that up, for Mark Rainbow as he heads up the prayer side of things through the North East Gospel Partnership, for uh, Duncan Woods as he's involved in that. We pray for these different men helping to lead that gospel partnership and pray that it might do great works for your glory and that might, uh, much fruit might be born from their work. And so, Father, uh, knowing that there are so many things to bring before you and to ask for your help with, we thank you and praise you that you listen. And we do pray for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to uh, sing again, and our next song is one that asks the Lord to speak in the stillness. So a bit of a prayer, really, as we come to God's word in just a moment. So let's stand and sing.
would take up your uh, Bibles. Now we're going to have two readings this morning. The first one's going to be from the book of Job, chapter 9, verses 1 to 10. And the second reading will be from John, chapter 6, verses 16 to 21. Lavinia's very, very kindly said she'll come and read to us. So the first one will be Job 9, 1 to 10. Job 9, verse 1 to 10. Then Job answered and said, Truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. He who removes mountains, and they know it not, when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place, and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun, and it does not rise, who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens, and trampled the waves of the sea, who made the bear and Orion, the Pallades and chambers of the south, who does great things beyond searching out and marvellous things beyond number. And then in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 16 to 21. Jesus walks on water. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. When they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Thank you very much, Lavinia. <laughs> Let me say a prayer asking for God's help as we turn to his word. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, that you speak to us. And we do pray now for your help by your spirit as we look at these words and think on these truths. We do pray that you'd help open our eyes and to change us as we do so. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, when you're frightened... What calms you down, I wonder? With small boys, it's often just a big embracing hug, isn't it? That kind of calms them down if they're frightened or scared. With teenagers, perhaps, it's more of a listening ear, being able to explain why things are the way that they are. With adults, perhaps it's more just the presence of a loved one that will calm us down and help us not to be so frightened. Or if we're in physical danger somewhere, it's the presence of someone who's in control of the situation. A policeman, fire service, something like that. Or perhaps if we're frightened of something like the future, something that's coming up, or some, some darkness on the horizon, then what is it that calms us down? Well, perhaps something like hope can help bring calmness in those moments. One of the few things that might then bring peace and calms our lurking fears. I wonder what it is. In today's uh, passage, I want to say that we have an immensely pastoral passage from John. You see, we're going to see that the disciples are out there battling in the dark 
the storms of the Sea of Galilee. And yet, you'll have noticed as we read through, in the middle of that storm, they become glad. They calm down. They're no longer so frightened. And so this morning, it's just a a short passage, but hopefully we're going to get a chance to dwell on the fact that it's the presence of Jesus in that situation that calmed them down and made them glad. So I've got three sections uh, to work through. If you've got a a Bible, do uh, follow along. Firstly, in verses 16 to 19, we're going to think about why it is that these disciples are so frightened. What is it that's causing their fright? Secondly, in verse 20, we'll see that Jesus reveals himself in an extraordinary way to these disciples. And then thirdly, in verse 21, we'll see how that revelation makes all the difference, makes all the difference to these frightened disciples. So firstly, verses 16 to 19, we're with these frightened disciples, and you could say that they are all at sea. The disciples are all at sea. Just before diving in, let's remember the the context that we're here in the book of John. We're in a section that's running all the way from chapter 5, verse 1, And it's going to keep going all the way through to chapter 8 and verse 11. And it's a section of the Gospel of John where Jesus is confessing his identity. He's unpacking who he is, his mission, what what he's here to do and, and his identity. He's shown it by doing various things. He's stated it so far, hasn't he? He's said it outright. And last week we were thinking about the feeding of the 5,000 or we said it might have been 10 or even 20,000. But that Jesus was an abundant provider last week. Just as God was in the Old Testament with the manna in the desert. So there was that crossover of identity. Just like God did in the Old Testament, so Jesus did in the New. Therefore you can see that they are one. And then in verse 15 of chapter 6, you might see that. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And that's where we start in verse 16 with the disciples. So let's just unpack a little bit about the disciples' situation, how they are really pretty frightened here. Firstly, because we're asking the question, where is Jesus? There's no Jesus around. And we've just been told that at the end of verse 15. And that's the first kind of indication to us as readers that the disciples are on their own. They're without Jesus, they're without their teacher. Perhaps think of like a group of high school students going off on a field trip and the teacher just says, oh, you go ahead, I'll catch up with you soon. Now, these disciples, they were grown men, they knew how to look after themselves, fine. But, verse 17, John is keen to state and restate Jesus had not yet come to them. So it's almost as if he's underlining it for us, saying Jesus isn't there. Jesus is absent from these disciples at the time. So, firstly, indication of why they're frightened, why they're all at sea, because there was no Jesus. Secondly, what time was it? What time was it? It was evening time. It was dark. And it gets dark, and Jesus is not with them, still in verse 17. Well, we know, don't we, from John's Gospel, that darkness is a negative thing. It's not portrayed as a a positive kind of situation. So to make reference to something happening in the dark or with darkness shows us that's a negative thing. From the very start of John's Gospel, chapter 1, we're told the world is in darkness because it's rejected God. And then there was the uh, episode with Nicodemus coming. He came in the dark. And that was a a negative thing there. And so here we have a situation where the disciples are in the dark. So, without Jesus, in the dark. Building this picture of why they're frightened, why they're all at sea. Thirdly, where are they? Well, they went down to the sea, didn't they, in verse 16. And they get in a boat and they head out onto the Sea of Galilee. And so they are literally at sea at this time. Now, yes, the sea would have been familiar to the fishermen among them, but still the seas and all that's in them would have been a pretty dark and foreboding place to these people. Bear in mind that their boats wouldn't have had electric-powered 
uh, lights and floodlights and things to illuminate what they're doing on the boat. It would have been pitch black. And the chaos of the waters rising and falling all around them would have been a scary thing for them. And in some thinking, particularly Old Testament, stormy seas and the, and the depths of the waters, they were often a picture, not just of sort of unknownness or chaoticness, but of darkness and evil. So there's a real kind of scaredness factor to being on the sea at night without Jesus. And fourthly, what happens with the weather? Well, verse 18, it becomes rough, doesn't it? Probably very little warning, because apparently there, the Sea of Galilee, these storms could come in very quickly, get very rough very quickly. And so suddenly they find themselves with the oars out, uh, battling against a strong sea, rowing into a headwind, rough seas all around them. Perhaps even just reading through this, if you're thinking Old Testament sort of echoes or bells ringing, think of Jonah stood holding onto the railing of the ship that he was on in the midst of the storm and thinking, oh dear, something is wrong here and the worry and wishing that the sea would calm down. And so I'm, I'm wondering as we're reading through this, what is in the heads of the disciples as they're there in the boat? Almost certainly you can imagine them puffing and panting as they're pulling on the oars, trying to make headway into uh, the storm. Three miles of rowing. So that's probably quite a long way uh, to row at sea. But we're not really told what they're thinking about the weather or the storm because that isn't necessarily what makes them frightened in verse 19. You've got all of this context as to why they would be frightened, but I think it's interesting there that it's not that that makes them afraid. It was when they saw Jesus coming towards them that we're told that they're afraid. But just before we get to that, I do think it's helpful for us to just kind of pause and have a look at the way in which this journey that the disciples have been on to this point is not all that dissimilar to our Christian lives, is it? We journey on often in the darkness of the world, which sometimes feels like it's getting darker as we go along. It can feel like the light of the gospel can be pushed to one side or feel very distant, like we're not quite sure where we're going. We journey on, and yet Jesus isn't physically here with us. He is by his spirit and his word, but not physically here uh, with us. It was Augustine uh, in the 3rd, 4th century who, reading this passage, said this. He said, the ship prefigured the church while Jesus is on high. He says that we as the church face darkness increasing, love waning, iniquity abounding, and these are the waves that rock the boat. But I like his next observation that he makes, which is very helpful. He says, meanwhile, the disciples struggled onward and kept advancing. Nor did those winds and storms and waves and darkness effect either that the ship should not make way or that it should break in pieces and founder. But amid all these evils, it went on. He's just drawing out from this story that yes, there are difficulties in life, the storms and the waves, and yet in here, the disciples, they kept on going forwards. The disciples, they were all at sea, and yet it almost does get worse before it gets better, doesn't it? Because in verse 19, they see something that causes them to be afraid. We've mentioned it, but it's not a huge wave bearing down on them or another boat about to crash into them. What did they see? They saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat. So we thought about how the disciples were frightened, and understandably so, they're all at sea in that context, and yet here, verse 20, and the end of verse 19, we have this extraordinary revelation of Jesus. I think it's interesting to note that there have been some people, some scholars who have read this miracle, and they've tried to give explanations as to how it might have been possible that actually Jesus was walking on the seashore, and it was just an optical illusion. It looked like he was on the waves. But no, he was just walking on the seashore. Or another one I read was that uh, apparently there might have been possible for there to have been a layer of ice under the water. 
and he was merely standing on that as the way. Anyway, I'm not sure I was persuaded by those things. Because, no, what we have here, we have a boat a long way out to sea. A long way out to sea. They're rowing along. And in this miraculous moment, Jesus walks across the water to them. And it's because he's doing this that it shows us his huge statement about his identity. That's the purpose of him doing this. And as he approaches, the disciples are stunned, aren't they? Amazed and afraid, speechless even. Because it's not them that speak first, is it, here? They were frightened, but they don't start shouting at Jesus. It's Jesus that speaks to them. And he doesn't try to overawe them or scare them or intimidate them. He speaks some amazingly powerful words in more ways than one. What does he say? He says, it is I, do not be afraid. It is I, do not be afraid. Or you could translate it, I am, do not be afraid. Same phrase, it is I or I am, you could translate it either way. So I want to say at least two extraordinary things to notice here. Firstly, where is Jesus standing when he says these words? He's standing on the waves. That's where he's standing, where he speaks these words. If we were to do a a Bible overview, a very brief one, go back to Genesis 1, or in John 1, we know that in the beginning, the Spirit was hovering over the waves. And now Jesus turns up here, walking on the face of these stormy waves. And it was only there in a very brief moment in Job, but you might have noticed in the reading we had from the book of Job, verse 8, Job declares that God alone treads on the waves of the sea. That's why I turned to that and asked Lavinia to read that earlier. It's that description of who is God. Well, God is the one that can alone tread on the waves. And here we have Jesus stood there, treading on the waves, which is hopefully pointing out to us just who Jesus is because of where he is standing. And so this is an incredible moment. We're seeing the creator of the universe controlling physics to his own ends and in doing so, revealing his true identity. And so the disciples then, they're in the presence of God. Being in the presence of God... If you'll read through the Old Testament, you'll realise it was a fairly fear-inducing thing. Like in Moses in, Exodus... <coughs> Excuse me. Moses in Exodus 3. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And just like at the burning bush with Moses, God talked first. Moses was afraid, and yet God spoke to him from the burning bush. And so that's a... Second extraordinary thing to notice, we've had where he's standing, but now we'll also need to pay attention to what he says. What does Jesus say? He says, it is I. Now, given the language used, it could have just been Jesus saying, hi guys, it's me, you know me, I've come to get in the boat, you left me behind, you know, here I am. It could just be that kind of a hello, it is I, it's me, it's I. It could just be that, it could be. But I think when you open up the possibility of translating it as I am, which is a fair translation, then I think it helps us see that the statement isn't quite so ordinary. In fact, it's a bit more extraordinary and intentionally so. Because, in effect, looking at the whole scene, what is ordinary about the scene? A man stood on the waves talking to some people in a boat. There's not much ordinary about that. So I think this is legitimate to translate it in this extraordinary way. I am. And that would be the same formula that God used back in Exodus 3 when he spoke to Moses from the burning bush. I am who I am. So it's this language being used both of Jesus and of God in the Old Testament. So we're seeing this identity being pulled out very clearly. And then it'll also fit with the other I am statements that we get in the book of John going forwards. We haven't got to many of them yet, but we'll come across them soon in the book of John. So Jesus here, he's claiming what only Jesus can claim. He's claiming to be God. 
the God who met with Moses at the burning bush and the God who alone can walk on the waves. But what else does he say? He says, I am, but he also says, do not fear. He doesn't just leave it with, I am who I am and stop there. He says, do not fear. And when he does, I think we are supposed to be flooded with relief. Relief that he's such a gracious and comforting God and reassuring to these kind creatures who were in front of him, who were scared both of the situation they found themselves in, but without Jesus and in the dark and at night and at sea. They're probably still not quite clear on what's going on, but they can see this man standing on the waves. They know it's Jesus. And he says to them, do not be afraid. And so we see, through this miracle then, extraordinary revelation. So we've seen the disciples, first of all, they're frightened, they're all at sea, but now we've seen Jesus come and bring extraordinary revelation. Thirdly, though, we're going to see that his presence makes them glad. Because in verse 21 it tells us, Then they were glad to take him into the boat. His calm, so his presence, calms their lurking fears. They're frightened. They're afraid. And yet his words and his presence calm them right down. They're no longer scared. And in many ways, the conclusion to the story is very limited in detail, isn't it? If you look at the end of verse 21, it's all very quick to say, he got into the boat, they were glad, they got to where they were going, the end. <laughs> kind of a very, very quick uh, ending. But it's this response of the disciples, this glad reassurance and comfort that I think we're therefore left to be kind of noticing as he comes into the boat to be with them. And I think that is a good way to apply this passage, to think about this real note of pastoral care and comfort of Jesus, even when we are frightened and all at sea. Why? Well, because Jesus reveals himself to be the true, the almighty God, the great I am, the one who can tread on the waves, as we were thinking about from the book of Job. So that's his identity. That's who Jesus is. And I guess the question for us then this morning is, have we realised that? Have we recognised that that is who Jesus is claiming to be and showing himself to be? He does make this huge claim that he is the God of the entire universe. He can trample the waves. He's showing that to us here. Not just a moral teacher, not just a nice guy, but God on earth. Have we realised that? Perhaps we do feel like we are floundering, desperately seeking rescue and worried. Maybe we wouldn't even be in the boat if we call the boat at the church. Well, today's a great day to get into that boat, to be part of the church, to be part of God's people, to come to recognise who Jesus is and so to follow him. But if we do think of being in that boat, in his church, well then, can I say that when we are frightened by the waves that rock us to and fro in life, or frightened at the prospect of thinking of death, well then we can come to Jesus and hear his words. What are his words? It is I, do not be afraid. I mentioned Augustine early, earlier, he's an early church father, he puts it like this, he says... Why then are you afraid, O Christians? Christ speaks, it is I, be not afraid. Why are you alarmed at these things? Why are you afraid? I have foretold these things, I do them. They must necessarily be done, it is I. Do not be afraid. Therefore, they would receive him into the ship, recognising him and rejoicing. They are freed from their fears. And immediately the ship was at the land to which they went. There is an end made at the land, from the watery to the solid, from the agitated to the firm, from the way to the goal. So you're saying as Christians, we don't need to be afraid of what we face, whatever that might be. I think another place in scripture that puts it more beautifully than I ever could is Psalm 46. So if you would, just indulge me, turn with me to Psalm 46. I'd just love to read through that. It's such a wonderful psalm of comfort, which really resonates 
with what's being said here. So Psalm 46, let me just read uh, through that, thinking with some of these categories of how it is Jesus who says, do not be afraid. Starting at verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Salah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Salah. There we go. It's the same God. It's the same God, isn't it? In the Old Testament and in the New, when Jesus turns up, he could have recited that psalm to the disciples there on the sea, couldn't he? He just said, it is I, do not be afraid. But all of that is behind that statement, that God is our rock, our fortress, and our refuge. So there is no need to fear. This is the God who is Jesus and who reveals himself as such. He didn't go about undercover, trying to keep it quiet as to who he was. No, he showed uh, very clearly who he is through doing these things and he's the one in whom we are to put our trust that's the call isn't it of the christian one commentator said the task of discipleship can be described quite simply as trusting in the inexplicable and all-consuming god made known in jesus christ without all questions being answered and doubts being solved the christian trusts in the god who need say nothing more than i am in order to calm our fears. So you see, it's this this faith and this calmness and this gladness that can come out of seeing the presence of Jesus, of knowing Jesus, of being with him on a regular basis through his word, in our times of prayer, in those kind of uh, moments, seeing and knowing uh, Jesus. And I think that over the past uh, few months that I've been here, I've just so encouraged by the fact that it just seems so evident here that people are leaning on Jesus, knowing Jesus, being comforted by Jesus and being glad in Jesus in the face of the storms of life, of suffering, of difficulties, of pain, of illness, and yet a solid and firm hope and a gladness in Jesus Not just a stoicism that says, oh, I'll be okay, but one that says, because I've got Jesus and because I know Jesus, I don't need to be afraid. I've I've seen that and that's been such an encouragement here. Yes, we could all always do so more and more and that would be the encouragement. I think I'd love to say that this church doesn't seem to be one frightened by everything going on, fearful of all of the different winds of life. And so in that case, it's a case of carrying on, trusting in Jesus. The one that comes and says, it is I, do not be afraid. So let's pray then this morning that we continue trusting and being steadfast in the Lord. Our Father, we thank you so much that Jesus came into this world, that he came into the darkness that he dwelt among us and that in the midst of storms, in the midst of misunderstanding, in the midst of hard times and trials, he came and he said, do not be afraid.
We thank you so much that we need not be afraid, but we can run to you as our fortress, our refuge, our stronghold. And so we do thank you so much for Jesus, and we do pray that he would calm our fears, whatever they might be this morning. We'll all have our own things in our mind that, that are right there around us each and every day. And we do just pray that you'd help us to see those things and to turn to Jesus. And because of Jesus and because of knowing Jesus, be able to say that we are not afraid, that there is peace, there is calm amidst the storms of life. And we do pray that you'd help us to keep doing that day by day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We now have a chance to share the uh, share communion uh, together. And so Mark is going to come and lead us through that. Thank you very much, Mark. As we come around the Lord's table this morning, I had um, three specific points to make, and I think Rob has made them uh, much clearer than I could make them, so I'm not going to really say much this morning, um, but I am going to read a word of Scripture. But the points are that if we're in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace, we have hope, and we have purpose. And we've been learning about that um, when we've been trialling the Hope Explored course in our Wednesday night Bible studies over the last three weeks. So peace, hope, and purpose. The Christian has this. And as we come around the Lord's table, let's just think about that. That assurance we have of peace, hope, and purpose in our lives. And I'll pick a piece of scripture which I think demonstrates this more than others. <clears throat> I'd like to read from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Though with him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has, give, has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For, once, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. And I think that's probably the most important thing. The purpose is that we've been reconciled to God. Isn't that amazing? And it's only through the death uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, taking our punishment on his shoulders, that we can have this reconciliation. So we're going to remember a little bit about that as we come around the table. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I thought we might have a time of one or two open prayer, and then I'll ask Rob to give thanks for the bread and Steve to give thanks for the wine.
with us. Each one of us, Drake and Evelyn Todd, that we are with us always. Lord, we thank you that from our reading today we see that no storm is too great for you. Whatever is raging around us, you're on top of it. Nothing can thwart you, and nothing can stop you from helping us. So we just praise you, Lord. We just thank you. And we just pray that, like the disciples, we are comforted and strengthened by your love, by your presence. To you be the praise and the glory. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, our Father, we give you thanks this morning that once again we are privileged to come along come around the Lord's table to remember him, to remember the one who came from heaven's glory, who found the passion of man for the suffering of death, even as awful death as a cross of Calvary. Father, we give you thanks for the giving of your only begotten Son, the one in whom you were ever well pleased. The one who could say, I do always those things which please the Father. We give you thanks for the perfect Son of Man, the perfect Son of God. This morning, Father, we bow in worship before that one, the one of perfection, and the one who went to Calvary and on there bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. Father, we give you thanks for the one who in the garden could say, not my will, but your will be done. It was the Father's will that he should go to Calvary and there shed his own precious blood that we should be redeemed. Oh, Father, it is beyond measure our understanding of your love toward us. And yet we accept it. We accept it, Father, because it is your word. It is in your word that you have declared that you were in eternity past chosen people for yourself. And this morning, we are a recipient of that promise. We give you thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, for who he is, the great I am, and for all that he has done for us. In his own worthy and precious name, amen. amen. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for once again this opportunity to come close to you through this simple meal. We thank you, Lord, for your death that set us free from the penalty of sin. And we thank you now, Lord, as we remember you in your death, that you promised that you were coming back again. And you will come again, Lord, and take your people to be with you. So come, Lord Jesus. Come. Amen. Father, we thank you for a chance to take bread and wine together. We thank you for the bread that speaks to us of Jesus' body broken, where it should have been us. Thank you for his sacrifice in that way. And we do pray that as we eat the bread, that you would bless us and help us to feed by faith on him and be nourished. Thank you for that.
darling, thank you that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself. Thank you that the gospel message is to bring people back to know you as, as Lord and Savior. And we ask in your mercy and help us to understand more of the privilege of being in Christ and being able to draw near to you in the Holy of Holies, only because of Jesus and his sacrifice. We thank you that all this hinges on the cross, on the death and resurrection of our Savior. And we thank you for the wine which speaks of your blood shed for us. And we ask we might eat and drink of the word of God. In Jesus' name. We'll retain the cup and we'll drink together. What a privilege this morning to know that we've been reconciled to the living God, the Holy One, um, even though we are sinless, uh, sinful creatures, but it's only by the blood of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Till he comes. We're going to sing again now, and our final song is Tell Out My Soul, Greatness of the Lord. So let's stand and sing.
That's it for this part of the meeting, but um, there will be refreshments uh, served just in the back hall, so do stick around uh, for that. But as we close, let me read a uh, closing benediction. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you all. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.